the first panel we'll have will talk about the global view of exports and ports, and I'd like to introduce our first uh, panel. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, Mayor Bob Foster of Long Beach, home to our nation's largest port. Mayor Foster has advocated frequently within the conference on the need for efficient goods movements as part of our economy. Mayor Foster will be followed by James Diffley, who will discuss the new U.S. Conference of Mayors Metro Economy Report that we'll be releasing today. Mr. Diffley is Vice President for the Regional Economies of IHS Global Insight, one of the leading economic forecasting firms in the U.S. As many of you know, the conference and Global Insight have enjoyed a 10-plus year collaborative effort in analyzing the role of, of our cities and suburbs play in the nation economy. Jim will be followed by one of the leading U.S. economists on ports and exports, which is John Martin. John is president of Martin Associates and has worked extensively with U.S. ports industries providing economic analysis. Gentlemen, welcome <laughs> Mayor Foster. Thank you very much, Mayor Brown. I want to also thank you for, I've never been to Jacksonville, and I have to tell you the hospitality that I've experienced is, uh, is really, truly gratifying and a very hospitable place. I'll be back. It's a great place. Thank you, sir. You know, it's good to see my friend Mayor Smith and obviously always Mr. Cochran. And I also want to thank Siemens as well uh, uh, for sponsoring this. Uh, and another role that I have as chairman of the independent system operator in California runs the electric grid and the electric market. I won't get into that, but we do a lot of work with Siemens and they do excellent work. And uh, thank you for sponsoring this meeting. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, a larger view of ports. And bef uh, before I start here, I wanted, if you, if you really think that ports can't make a difference or both imports, exports, and the whole international trade area, I can tell you that in the early 90s, uh, Long Beach was not in recession conditions, it was in depression conditions. You had uh, 50,000 aerospace and defense jobs uh, left the area right around Long Beach. It's a, a city of about half a million people, uh, uh, good paying jobs uh, with, the, with the scale down in the defense and aerospace industries, those were gone. And then a year or two later, the Navy left. Uh, most of you think of Long Beach as a Navy town, it's changed dramatically. A lot of you have been there, you've seen that. So. How do you rebuild after you lose that great economic base? And uh, the major sector that's rebuilt Long Beach is international trade. Uh, a dramatic improvement in throughput through the port, a dramatic improvement in employment, that along with a, a, a very large medical in, uh, establishment influx into the city has really helped bring Long Beach back to, uh, uh, from the depths of very serious economic doldrum. So it, it, it makes a huge difference. Let's see if I can get this right. Hey, what do you know? Uh, as you heard, uh, Long Beach uh, is the second busiest port in the United States. Now, we usually take the whole San Pedro com uh, complex, which is the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles. Um, Long Beach is, uh, a, uh, L.A. is a little bit larger. Together, I'll go through that in a minute, but uh, it's just off on this map, it would be off to the left-hand side, be the Port of Los Angeles. They're, they look like one complex if you look at them. Uh, it's the leading gateway to the U.S. for Asia trade. Uh, uh, Long Beach has 6.1 million containers, or what it calls 20-foot equivalents. That's how you measure this in this business. It's in 20-foot equivalents, uh, although a lot of the containers are 40 feet, sometimes even larger. Uh, it's $155 billion in trade in Long Beach annually, and it supports more than, both ports support more than 316,000 jobs in Southern California, and 1.4, and I'll talk about that in a moment, nationally. If you look at the leading container ports, and Tom touched on this, we, we tried to highlight this issue a couple of years ago and uh, never really got moving on it, but uh, this is a huge issue. Um, take the, you see now how Shanghai and Singapore and Hong Kong have, uh, are the largest ports in the world. These are container ports. Uh, the complex in San Pedro now is six, it used to be three. Uh, you know, this is not a race of any kind, but it just shows you how much trade is going on 
particularly in Asia. Uh, and if you took them the, the separately, you'll see Los Angeles with 7.8 and 6.1 respectively TEUs for, so they would rank 15th, uh, in six, 15th and 17th in the world, even on their own. They're clearly the largest in the country. And this is one of the reasons. If you look around the distribution markets around the country, this is distribution space. Uh, in Southern California, you've got 1.7 billion square feet of distribution space. And the second uh, nearest is Chicago uh, with about, uh, about a billion. And it's uh, distributed around the rest of the country. And you'll, you can have a copy of this if you like. Just give you an idea how much, uh, how enormous the distribution space is uh, throughout uh, the country and particularly in Southern California. This is actually, and by the way, for those of you, we, we had this broken down by congressional district, and I can get that for you if you like, because it really is important to let people in Congress know how many jobs are directly and indirectly related to international trade. And this is just for the San Pedro ports. And as you can see, how many jobs around the country, just take the southeast where we are now, you've got almost half a million jobs that are directly related to international trade through San Pedro. 43% of all the containerized cargo in the country comes through the San Pedro ports. And uh, has a huge effect on economics and commerce throughout the country. Now, one of the things you heard about is infrastructure. Uh, one of the important things is to, if, you, uh, if you've been to ports around the world, go to Rotterdam or Hamburg, you will see very, very, one of the problems, very modern ports. These things are, uh, uh, they're almost, they're, a lot of them are run almost without any human beings on them. They're automated. You, it's an odd thing to see yard hostlers, the thing that carry the containers around the ports to the stacks, running around with no drivers. I mean, they're, they're all on grids. You have four guys in a, in a control tower with joysticks running the entire port. Uh, it really is amazing to see that. And it's much more efficient, obviously less costly. Uh, and it, it, it makes the, uh, those ports very attractive. That has to happen in the U.S. There's several things that have to happen. Automation is one of them. You will run into IB, uh, ILWU issues. I believe those can be dealt with. It was certainly dealt with overseas in Europe where unionization is also very strong. And you also have to modernize your port. You've got to put more on dock rail to be more efficient. You've all, and you've got to make the facilities conducive for the much larger ships. I was talking to Don Schneider from our port, and when he started in this business, a big ship coming into Long Beach was 500 TEUs. Today's, the average one's probably about 8,000, and they're coming in now eventually with 13 and 14,000 TEU. You have to have the facilities to handle this. So we're doing that in Long Beach. We have a 10-year, $4.4 billion capital investment project. It includes terminal developments. This is a picture of Middle Harbor, which is uh, taking uh, uh, two 100 each uh, uh, acre terminals and creating one large, efficient 350 uh, acre terminal uh, with on dock rail. And it, uh, it'll be much, it'll be completely automated, much more efficient. On dock rail will be more efficient. It, the, the whole idea here is to get greater volumes of cargo at greater velocities through your port. The Gerald Desmond Bridge, which is one of the links in Sa to the San Pedro area is a bridge that is of the same design as the one that failed in Minnesota. Uh, it's in the process now. The bid should be open in, in the next uh, month or so uh, to replace that bridge. Key link infrastructure, about another billion dollars is included in here. And several uh, terminals are going to be uh, enhanced, redesigned, and automated, uh, both uh, brownfield and greenfield. And I will tell you, obtaining the funds for this is very difficult. We had a, some, some federal money albeit, uh, I believe, inadequate. But between state, uh, state money, transportation bonds, and uh, our own financing at the port, we're able to, to move this along. This, by the way, is kind of a nice little stimulus for uh, the Long Beach area. This is a big shot in the arm. But infrastructure is key to be able to move goods in and out of here. And then the infrastructure behind it, all the rail systems and highway systems, which I think has been ignored primarily by the federal government, is also essential. It doesn't do any good to get stuff through the, through the port immediately very quickly, only to have it sit around uh, for days sometimes before it gets where it needs to be. Now, one of the other things you need to do is to, in, uh, we had to do this, 
This is a large industrial complex uh, surrounded by several residential areas. Uh, the, the ports uh, are a leading contributor to air pollution uh, and water pollution, but primarily air, and it, uh, you had all kinds of studies of how many premature deaths, et cetera. I won't get into that, but you really have to clean up. Uh, and I, and I, I don't care where you are, and I would suspect that any federal dollars are going to be tied to cleanups. We've done a great job here. We, we, uh, in 2006, we adopted a plan, um, a green port policy. Uh, we, our goal was to reduce pollution, air pollution by 45 percent by 2012. Uh, we updated that in uh, 2010. This includes things like uh, putting a program in for clean trucks. We're in the, we're, we've hit the final phase of this. Today, you do not enter the port of Long Beach unless you have a 2007 or cleaner truck or newer truck. Dramatically reducing diesel particulate matter, dramatically reducing uh, all the uh, all the air components, air, air pollution components. Uh, it, it's not cheap. Uh, this one happened to be done beyond our wildest expectations. The private sector stepped up and changed out a lot of this. We do things with the ships in terms of slowing vessel speeds down. We've got uh, cold ironing where ships are under electricity when they're hoteling in the port. All those need to be done, uh, or you're going to get an extraordinary amount of pushback from people around. It's the right thing to do, period. And, it, and the technology is there, and in fact, the money's there to do it uh, from a lot of sources. And when you, uh, you can't read that, can you? Well, the numbers aren't there, but that's Press okay. One, I'll read them off. Press one more time. Again. Again. Oh, that's clever. Thank you. <laughs> we, we, we're a team. Yeah, well, then I appreciate that. Uh, we, we've been successful beyond our goals, well beyond our goals. Right now, diesel particulate matter is down 72%. You have sulfides, uh, uh, sulfur oxides down 73%. Nitrogen oxide, 73 percent, and greenhouse gas is down 18 percent. And we're continuing on this program. And I'll tell you, it's made, it's made it easier to get environmental impact reports approved. It's, it's, it, you, you know, without this, it would be very difficult to modernize your ports. Now, just a couple of things that concluding remarks on this. Uh, we have uh, the infrastructure beyond the ports is in, is in, great need of uh, improvement and repair, uh, not only for the transport of the material, but also to get the buy-in and support of the communities for, uh, around you. For example, the Inland Empire, and I, I know BNSF knows this, there are an enormous number of crossings at grade. They're not separated at grade. So the more you have, the more you have train uh, traffic through there, the more trains are going through, the more you're going to tie up traffic in a lot of these uh, cities along the way, and there are a lot of cities between us and the East Coast, uh, the eastern border of California, and uh, there's really there's inadequate inadequate funding that doesn't even cover it. There's almost we can do maybe I think the numbers are the three or four a year, and there's scores of them, and that has to happen. I mean, we just can't have that impact out there. The trains slow down a little bit. But all the highway systems, all the things that require, uh, you're required for goods movement, it's a system. You've got to treat it as a system. You can't just worry about one node here and forget everything else. And we haven't had a national policy on this for a long, ever, and, and we really need one. And we need attention at the national level for spending on these issues. Uh, I'll just touch very briefly on uh, exports. The primary export that we have uh, are agricultural products scrap metal, paper, those kinds of things. We see a slight in, increase in, in uh, manufactured goods and machines. Uh, we're concentrating on agricultural exports because a lot of from the Western United States comes through California. We're building a brand new grain storage system and a few other things. We see exports as a, uh, a, a, a very big path to improved economics and improved employment uh, in a variety of areas. and. Uh, a lot depends on the dollar and its strength and those kinds of things before you see manufactured goods. But I think when your Global Insight will touch on this, uh, we're, we've seen a, an uptick in, in exports, a substantial uptick uh, in the last couple of years, and we expect that to continue. I won't go into all the things we're doing in terms of our trade policies and our free trade zones. We're really designing this to try to help commerce in and out of the port whenever we can. I'll just conclude by saying one of the things that it was, I think, really important to note is that 
We really don't, as I said, don't have a policy at the national level on this. And I think if you couple it with cleaning up the environment, producing jobs, and making sure that if we get the, if, if you get the federal investment, you do both of those, I think we can make a good case to make sure that we get the, uh, the right amount of capital to improve our ports. It's been ignored for too long. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Foster. Let's give him a hand for that presentation. Great job. Uh, next, we'll have uh, James. De Thank you, Mayor Brown. You all have uh, the report we're releasing today as series of, part of our series of metro economies. Here we focus on exports and the opportunities uh, and Manda mandatory directives we have, if you will, or necessities for uh, growth in exports and continued growth in the U.S. economy over the next decade. It's chock full of data that I know you all love to use in, in your work and, uh, and efforts to persuade it and the like, and I encourage you to do so. Uh, we are in the U.S. slowly but surely recovering from the Great Recession. The recovery is slow, with unemployment painfully high for some years to come, I might Warn, warn us, because our households, banks, businesses, and governments continue to borrow and spend less than they had in the past, necessarily reducing their debt to rebalance in the hangover from the housing bubble and the borrowing spree of the past decade, most recent decade. But this reduced spending, whatever it is for healthy in terms of economic portfolios, reduces demand, reduces the demand for U.S. goods and services, slowing GDP growth. In this environment, exports, the demand for our goods and services from overseas, becomes a larger factor and more important driver of U.S. economic growth. Over this decade, 2010 to 2020, we expect ep exports to account directly for almost 40 percent, 40 percent of all U.S. GDP growth, gross domestic product growth. Or think of it this way. We forecast that the U.S. economy will grow at close to 3 percent rate, annual rate, every year on average over this decade. Exports will continue, will contribute more than one percentage point of that 3 percent, of that of close to 3 percent. In this report, we document the Metro's contribution. Metro's account for 88 percent of the nation's exports, hence are vital to the health and continued recovery and growth of the national economy. It is clear from that that our ports and our transportation infrastructure need to remain efficient and competitive to generate the needed export activity for our continued economic health. The potential for metro economic growth is clear. In this report, we document our fastest growing by metro trading partners, those that will demand ever more goods and services from our metro areas. China and India, for instance, will grow to more than 250 percent of their 2010 size over the course of this decade. In the report, we detail for the largest 50 metros their leading foreign export destination, and the potential growth from that source of demand for their goods and services. Similar, similarly, for the 150 largest metros, we document the leading product group they export, again indicating potential export growth over the course of this decade from worldwide growth in that industry in which they specialize or in which they have a comparative advantage. For instance, in 40 metro areas, 41 metro areas, and not just ports, across the country we see the clear potential, potential if we can maintain our competitiveness in infrastructure, et cetera, for 70 percent growth in exports in each of those metros this decade. The metro economies that develop trade relations with the fast-growing industries and with the rapidly growing countries of the world will be poised to generate robust job and gross metro product, GMP growth, for the years and decades to come. And with that, I wish you luck in your endeavors. Thank you, James, for that. Uh, let's give him a hand for that uh, quick summary. And, and, you, and you, we have the report, and we're going to do a release today. Next, we'll hear from uh, John Martin. John. Is that 
it's not the right one. Very good, thank you. Good pleasure to be here, Mayor Brown. Thank you, and uh, the rest of the delegates. My talk today. I, I, if I stand up, can you hear me? If I talk like that, it's, I, it's very difficult to talk and look. What I'm talking about today is kind of a, a history of where we where we came from in the early mm -hmm. '90s with respect to container trade, the shifting trade patterns in container trade, the growth, potential growth that we're seeing from uh, the expansion of the Panama Canal, increase trading partners' use of the Suez Canal, the importance of export, the importance of the President's export initiatives, and what that means for economic development, and then the call for infrastructure investments, particularly amongst our ports, deep water as well as inland waterway ports. When you look at what has happened over time with respect to imports and exports, you can see that over time, between 1995 and 2011, there has been, the reds are exports, the blues are imports. There's been a growth of about 3.7% compounded annual growth rate in, ex in export activity <coughs> while all ports in the United States measured in terms of metric tonnages. And import tonnages have grown around 6% over time. Well, what does that mean? That means the share of imports, we've become an import-dependent country with respect to containerized cargo. And as you can see, the share of, of imports was around, around 50% in 1995 and has dropped to its lowest point in 2004, 2005, 2006, when we were growing and growing and growing in terms of expenditures, uh, borrowing high credit, and buying more and more imports, becoming more and more import dependent. That trend has reversed somewhat, and it's starting to come back. It's still below the 1995 levels, but we're seeing it's starting to approach the 45, 46% level uh, in 2011. These de this data was just released last week by the Census of Foreign Trade. Most of the containerized exports move via the West Coast ports. About 45% of that move through Pacific Southwest ports, which is primarily Los Angeles and Long Beach. Oakland is the Northern California port in terms of containerized cargo, and then the green is the Pacific Northwest ports. One of the things you can see, the South Atlantic ports have had a growing share of exports, which are in the yellow, and the, um, and the Gulf has started also to grow export shares as well, <coughs> primarily focusing on Latin America and South America. With respect to the imports, the West Coast imports do handle also about 45% of containerized imports in the United States. But what's important here is that 35%, the majority of those imports, if you remember the, that share for Southern, Southern California was relatively smaller with respect to exports. But with respect to imports, the, the complex, the San Pedro ports of Los Angeles, Long Beach have historically handled the majority of that West Coast import tonnage and we're really the, the, the suppliers or the gateways for imported Asian cargo coming through. However, beginning in 2001, 2002, the share of, of, of cargo handled by the Southern California ports has actually declined somewhat. Why is that happening? During the mid-1990s to late-1990s, early 2000s, basically every beneficial cargo owner, we call them now BCOs, that's a term that's been developed over the last five years, I'm not sure where it came from, but BCOs have forced cargo to come through Los Angeles and Long Beach. That was where all the logistics and the distribution centers were, were established, the Inland Empire that was talked about. You really had to use LA Long Beach as your major gateway for Asian cargo. Distribution center grew, cross dock operations grew. Cross dock operations meaning you, you strip a, a, a marine container, which is typically a 20 foot or a 40 foot container put it into a 53-foot rotability container that allows you to be, have economies of scale in the transportation because most of the Asian imports cube out a container rather than weight out the container. So the bigger your space you have, the better uh, economies of transportation. There were tremendous, during that time period, 1990, late 1990s through the mid 2000, early 2000s, there was a lot of rail investments in Southern California uh, to improve the velocity of the rail to serve places like Chicago in fact, transit times were, 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 were being improved from Los Angeles, Long Beach, into the Chicago area to, be, to, to compete with Pacific Northwest times out of Seattle and Tacoma. <coughs> but then there were shocks that occurred in the economy. We had 9-11, which caused a, uh, an impact, particularly on ports, investments in infrastructure, both 
systems preservation, uh, infrastructure meaning uh, just normal maintenance, but as well as uh, market-driven investments because more investment had to be put on procured. The most important factor that occurred though was in September of 2002 for a 10-day period when the West Coast ports locked out the longshoremen due to some labor management issues. During that time, it was probably the most disruptive supply chain impact that, that really uh, importers had seen up to that time period where cargo was, was actually, there were ships that were chartered uh, by several of the, the large uh, box store importers that started coming across into <coughs> Norfolk rather than coming into, uh, into the West Coast, into the West Coast ports. That, so that, that, that was the major impact when they shut down the ports for 10 days, the uh, federal government, we did a lot of work during that time period before the Federal Reserve more than canceled that number five and the Pacific Maritime Association to identify when to enact Taft Hartley uh, to, to open the ports back up at that time. We also had, right after the ports opened, we had started to have capacity issues. And there were land and labor shortages. People were saying we were out of capacity. Our density, the container terminals, even in Los Angeles, was still 6,500 TEUs per acre. In Asia, it's usually around 8 to 10 to 12 to 15,000 TEUs per acre. You heard the mayor of Long, Long Beach talk about densification that's definitely needed in the United States through automated container terminals. It's moving, but very slowly. During that same time period, there were rail, and, rail equipment and truck shortage problems into the Southern California ports. There were high intermodal rates coming from the West Coast to the East Coast, particularly out of the Pacific Northwest. There became a search for alternatives, and as a result of that, we started having this growth in all water services. Okay. I need to move around when I talk, so it's very difficult. Anyway, so there, there are basically two routings to the to all west to uh, Asian cargo coming into the East Coast. One is through the Panama Canal, and one is through the Suez Canal. Currently, the Panama Canal has size limitations. The size limitations limit the vessels to, to uh, what we call Panamax size vessels, which are 40-foot draft, et cetera. Um, but by 2014, the expansion of the canal, uh, we will allow larger vessels to transit that canal uh, up to 85, 9,000, 10,000 TEU vessels. That will improve the economies of shipping, will improve the competitive issues on the East Coast and the Gulf Coast ports to compete with West Coast ports for Asian imports. But we still have a problem with transit time issues in terms of the time it leaves Asia to the time it gets to Chicago through East Coast or Gulf Coast port versus a, a West Coast port. On the Suez Canal, and by the way, the carriers prefer to use an all-water service, the ocean carriers, because they can internalize the revenue that they would pay the railroads for the intermodal move so they can keep the box on the ship longer and make more revenue. With respect to the Suez Canal, that does accommodate larger vessels, but as you know now, we have tremendous p political instability in the, uh, in the Gulf uh, area and the Suez, which is, is piracy as well as political instability. The Suez Canal gives you better transit time to Southeast Asia and India. Um, it still has a transit time problem with respect to getting into the Midwestern portions, but it's, it's very well positioned to handle the shifting trade patterns we're seeing coming out of Southeastern Asia, particularly India, Cambodia, and Vietnam. We have a lot of investment going on in India, um, and as uh, I believe uh, James uh, had mentioned, that India is looking to grow dramatically mm -hmm. over the time period. There's also a lot of transshipment opportunities in the Suez where you have a lot of large container ships coming from Asia to the Mediterranean. They are then transshipped to smaller vessels that come into the United States or as well as go throughout Europe. With respect to that growth in all water services that we saw as a result of the 2002 impacts and 2002-2007 changes, there's been significant growth in distribution centers in the, in the South Atlantic and in the Gulf region, particularly in the Savannah region. Jacksonville region has been a very, very strong growth market in distribution centers to accommodate more all water services. Um, the proximity to southern India, Asia is a positive for the Suez Canal to grow more business through there. We're seeing more and more direct services, direct services meaning they're coming directly from Asia into the United States. For example, the MOL trade pack operations here in, in uh, Jacksonville where we have direct services coming through the Suez Canal. Uh, that's improving transit time differentials over the west coast routings and there's been additional port infrastructure development here on the east coast. 
Just to give you an idea of what is what, 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 what this translates into the growth in Asian services in all water services to, to the South Atlantic, North Atlantic, and Gulf, you can see, I just have to walk up there for a second. You can see the, <coughs> the green area, the, after 2002, this is imported Asian cargo, containerized Asian cargo, all, basically all water service. You can see how that growth, this is given to New York City, Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, significantly grew after 2002. Same way when you look at the growth through the South Atlantic ports, um, Savannah has really grew, grown dramatically over that time period. One of the reasons Savannah has grown is because the focus that the Georgia Ports Authority have always had on distribution center development. From the early 1980s, they developed the Kmart distribution center in Savannah, which led the way, to, they were well positioned then to, to grab onto the increased distribution center development on the East Coast and the Gulf Coast as a result of the, the, the dynamics that occurred after 2002. The, the Gulf Coast as well had the same type of tremendous increase in Asian oil water services after 2002. Now, during that time period, China has historically been the major trading partner, as you can see. The red has been about 40, about 35, 36 percent of growth in, in, in supplying exports to the United States or, or imports from, from China to the United States. But when you look at what's happening over time, and this is very important, the blue shows the change in imports from world areas, the containerized imports to the United States between 2002 and 10 and 2011, just last year. The red is the average compounded annual growth of imports from those trade areas. What you see is Cambodia, India, Sri Lanka, Vietnam are all becoming growth centers for exports. And over that five-year period, actually the growth imports of imports from Vietnam has been strongest compared to all other world areas, which is very interesting. What does that mean? That means that's moving more and more of the cargo wanting to go through the Suez Canal rather than through the Panama Canal because below Singapore, it's a better routing to the East Coast, the Gulf Coast, uh, through, through, the, through the Suez Canal rather than through the Panama Canal. There's been a lot of talk about the importance of the Panama Canal, and it's very, very important because it does change the dynamics of the shipping, the expansion of the Panama Canal. However, the actual volume increases through the Panama Canal into the U.S. East Coast and Gulf Coast ports <coughs> could be less than what everybody has talked about because the, the volume of goods moving is dependent upon logistics costs. It's dependent upon the demand and dependent upon the economic situations, not just because you opened the canal. There are a lot of factors that are in place that determine the flows of volumes through the Ca Panama Canal and through the Suez as well. One of the factors is, is that those changes that occur between 2002 and 2007 with respect to the West Coast shutdown, the, the labor shortages, the high intermodal rates have already occurred. And the West Coast ports, believe me, and the railroads are not going to sit by and let, your car let their cargo move through the East Coast and the Gulf Coast and not do anything about it. And already we have the West Coast Ports Coalition that, that, uh, that uh, the ports and the railroads and the, long, and the ILWU, the Longshore Warehouse Union, have been involved in, um, in marketing to, directly to Asian uh, importers or exporters to use it on the West Coast ports. The growth in the areas of the trade that we're, we'll, that we're seeing, are, like I said, is in South Vietnam, India, Cambodia, et cetera. Those are Suez uh, dominated trades. We're also seeing, and this becomes very important with respect to infrastructure investment, I'll talk about this in a few minutes, the Caribbean transshipment centers are becoming very important. I just got back, I was working in Jamaica on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday for growth, for development of, of transshipment hubs in Kingston. We're seeing in, in throughout Panama, Costa Rica, Puerto Rico, um, the, the, the MSC's operation, Freeport, Bahamas, etc. The ships are coming directly into those transshipment hubs, then relaying the cargo back into the East Coast and the Gulf Coast regions. So with respect to the, the, the Panama Canal, we will have larger ships. For by, by definition, the ca canal will handle larger ships and people will deploy larger ships. As a result, there's going to be need a, a lot of investment on the East Coast and Gulf Coast in terms of infrastructure, in terms of channel depth to accommodate the deeper ships. We have to have berth capacity to handle the long ships. They're much longer, so you need to have longer ship, mm -hmm. longer berths. We need to have crane outreach, new cranes that reach out over these much wider ships. All these require capital investment. 
The investment in the port infrastructure is completely critical to compete with the transshipment hubs. If you don't have 50 feet of water, you cannot really compete for a first inbound fully laden Pan greater than Panamax size vessel coming in. That means you won't be able to compete for more and more of the logistics center development that has occurred in the United States that will tend to go offshore. So that will lose jobs if we don't invest in our deeper waters. And then the investment in the port infrastructure is necessary to grow the deep water, to, to grow the exports as well. This just gives you an idea of the plans and depths of water channels uh, at the deep water ports. And you can see there's only three ports that have 50 feet of water, Norfolk on the East Coast, Norfolk, Baltimore, and New York, and Miami is, is authorized and funded to go ahead with their deepening projects. All these other ports, their plan depths and current depths are shown here. All of those require massive amounts of capital investment, which we do not have from the federal government. In addition to the deep water ports, there's 12,000 miles of inland waterway ports. There's 191 locked systems, 237 chambers, Back in 1994, which is the last date I can find when there was an estimate of the replacement cost of these, it was 125 billion in 1994, that's 20 years ago. 50% of those locks then were over 60 years of age, which, which really puts the, the, the safety factor at the forefront. <coughs> and in order for, the, for you to, to, if those locks fail, it's, it's catastrophic in terms of not just economic cost and the inability to move exports, for, particularly the bulk exports, but tremendous loss of life. Again. That type of infrastructure has not been brought to the forefront. The need for the inland waterways, just as well as for the deep water ports, is just as important in terms of infrastructure investment. Um, the ports have lost their funding. I mentioned the 9-11 situation. The downturn in trade drastically reduced the, um, the, the port revenues from wharfages and dockages. The economic crisis reduced the state and municipal funding. States are, are they're bonded out. The public municipal, municipalities are bonded out capacity. The Corps of Engineers really cannot fund the dredging deepening projects, nor can they maintain some of the channels that authorize depth, which means all that means is increased transportation costs. And what we've seen is private sector participation through port concessions has become very critical, where we're having large investment infrastructure funds coming in and, and, and helping out ports and investments. We have the National Trade Export Initiative that the President wanted, improving trade advocacy, increasing access to, cre to, to credit, removing the barriers, et cetera, and doubling exports over the next five years. Well, in order to do that, we have a lot of infrastructure <laughs> investment requirement. We have the, South, the, the, the free trade agreements that have been ratified already. None of this is important, can, can be occurred unless we have infrastructure. Just to get investments, unless, to give you an idea of what exports mean, if we did some work here in Florida recently for the Florida Chamber Foundation where we looked at the, the uh, if we doubled the exports in Florida, in, in terms of containerized exports, what does that mean? 95,000 jobs annually. That's 2,600 direct jobs, 2,800 induced jobs, 1,500 indirect jobs, and also 88,000 jobs just by growing export activity here within the state of Florida. That's a $14.9 billion economic activity to double those, those, those exports out of Florida. What does it all mean? The whole system from the marine transportation system, 16.2 million jobs nationally. $3.2 trillion worth of economic value, which is a quarter of the gross domestic product, is, is part of the port's marine transportation system's economic value to the, to the region, or to the, to the states. And the point is, the global economy is here. The port system has become completely integral in the world's logistics systems, both deep water and inland waterways. Infrastructure funds need to be, be acquired and secured from the federal government. The last round of TIGER grants, transportation <coughs> infrastructure grants, et cetera, only the port sector only got 15% of that. The rest went to other sectors of transportation. <coughs> and, in, and in my opinion, it's a demonstrated economic uh, uh, benefit for investments. There's not any other sector of the economy that I can think of that generates so much economic benefits in terms of job creation than does a dollar investment in the in port infrastructure. And I think that's the, the message that you, the mayors, need to take to the federal government to, to, because that is, that is the job growth. That right there it is. So with that, thank you. Thank you, John, for that great presentation. And now what I'd like to do is just uh, 
open it up for some questions and comments. We'll go around the room uh, and open it up for some questions and comments. I think, obviously, you've laid the foundation, and we have an opportunity to make some comments or raise, ask some questions to the panelists. Yes, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Uh, <clears throat> I know one of the things, of course, uh, Mayor Stodler and I uh, uh, traverse uh, on both sides of the Arkansas River in the central part, and we're part of a McClellan Current Navigation Project, and I know that one of the previous colonels of, uh, of, of the uh, area in, in Little Rock, you know, commented on how much, I think, one of those slides depicted that need there was in terms of the lock and dam or the in inland waterway system uh, and infrastructure improvements. And I guess, you know, what my, my question is, you know, is, is, you know, obviously I don't think private sector inv investment can be done. I don't know that there's ever a private sector investment aspect of a lock and dam system. So that, I, I would think, it would have to come from the federal government. So I guess my question, you know, is, is what is going on with regard to the needs, and maybe some of our friends from the Corps here can help us, you know, with the needs of, of the lock and dam systems on the inland waterways, because obviously I think as we, you know, look to the future, that portion of our transit system is going to be greater and greater impacted as we look to the rails and look to the waterways more so now that the highways, I think the second most congested section of the interstate system in the country, I believe, is between my city, North Little Rock, and, uh, and Memphis. Uh, you know, that section of I-40. So, you know, w we've got critical needs, obviously, all over the country, but this is certainly one, and I don't know if any of our friends from the Corps might have any insight to how we can do this. I don't think the private sector can get involved in this, as far as I understand. Jim. Go ahead, Jim. All right, thank you. I'm Jim Walker from the Corps of Engineers headquarters, and, and you're right, the inland navigation <coughs> uh, piece is a key part of the marine transportation infrastructure. Um, right now, our capital investments uh, are uh, very constrained because we have what's known as the Inland Waterways Trust Fund, and that trust fund finances 50% of the capital investments on inland navigation. So it's 50% from the general revenues and 50% from the Inland Waterway Trust Fund. Um, we're, we're recognizing that the amount of revenues that that's generating is insufficient to maintain a resilient uh, infrastructure uh, over the long term, and we're looking at trying to come up with ways to uh, address that. There was the development of a 20-year capital investment plan uh, worked out with the users uh, to look at both some changes in how we would go about our construction, but trying to identify a capital investment plan for 20 years it had five new locks, 16 uh, major rehabilitations, uh, had to do with some changes in proposed legislation to adjust the cost sharing that uh, would have to take place in trying to get to a larger construction program. Um, so that's still in the works, but it is, uh, it is it's not making a whole lot of progress right now with Congress um, in how we can do increased revenues to, to do more of these uh, locks. These locks are, like you mentioned, with infrastructure, uh, half of them are greater than 50 years old. Uh, there are in need of, of some major refurbishments out there to maintain a reliability and resiliency in the future. Um, the one other piece, there's, where there are, we are exploring the possibilities of public-private partnerships. Uh, we have private equity firms that have come to the Corps of Engineers that, that are looking at the opportunities to make infrastructure investments provided that they can um, work out a, a reasonable return for the investment that they would bring and how they can come and recoup their costs. Most of these uh, wind up looking at something like a user fee, and that's been something that the uh, waterway users have, have not uh, looked at favorably. So uh, there are discussions underway. We'll see where that takes us, but there's a, a quick synopsis of what's happening on the, the inland system. And really, that's, that's very key in how it links to the coastal ports and ultimately to the nation's exports. Mayor Brown, if I could, uh, you know, there's a couple of big in, important points that are brought up here, uh, and it's a great example. And one of our challenges in infrastructure investment is that not only are there 
you know, rivers and things where there is, it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, for private money to be invested. But also, much of our infrastructure investment doesn't have a direct return. You know, you can't put a dollar in here and then all of a sudden load that on user fees or whatever because the benefit of an infrastructure investment is so broad-based. It's measurable, but it's not, it's not specific to any one user because it's broad-based. And I think, obviously, we know that, that infrastructure investments tends to be very localized. Uh, that stretch of the freeway you have, you know, I-40 goes through northern Arizona and is a major, major deal. Well, what do I care about I-40 between Little Rock and Memphis? Well, I should because that traffic that f passes through Flagstaff, Arizona, eventually most of it ends up passing through Little Rock. And if I can't get that traffic through Little Rock, then that traffic's going to go elsewhere or else it's going to go offshore. And I think that's a connection that we have not done a good job of in, in this country of really understanding and of promoting, and I think one of the things we can do as a, as a conference is to is to talk about the need for a larger, even nationwide infrastructure plan, uh, because the benefits are so broad based, uh, and the the investment is as a, a magnitude that it needs to be made on a broader thing, which is why it's appropriate for government to get involved in these types of things. But that's not something we talk about a whole lot because everything is so localized as far as that lock, that stretch of the freeway, and other people don't care about it. And, and I, I think that's a message that we, we really need to work on uh, is, is the message of how important a nationwide plan is. It does matter what happens in the Port of Jacksonville, to Mesa, Arizona, and Long Beach, and other places like that. But we don't, we don't have that discussion very often. P.S. on top of that, uh, uh, Mayor, and I agree with you, Scott. Uh, one of the things that, that brought that home was when the barge ran into that uh, section of, uh, of I-40 bridge that uh, was just inside the Oklahoma border and, and the kind of disruption that that caused that major east-west transit section of our interstate, I-40, you know, that impacted everybody. So, you know, whether it be one section or, or larger congestion issues, it, it has a, a, a nationwide impact. So you're absolutely correct. Well, and I think the, the unfortunate thing is it takes those kinds of tragedies for us to recognize the ripple effect. You know, the bridge has got to fall down in Minneapolis. you got to have a barge hit. you got to have a, a hurricane hit that wipes out some, you know, stretch of road. Whatever it is, we tend to be playing catch-up all the time on our infrastructure. We didn't used to be like that. I mean, the entire interstate system was not a catch-up plan. It was a it, it was a, a vision, and it took 50 years to complete. But it was a it was a proactive, let's change the world kind of a plan, and we seem to have lost that. And I know that sounds all touchy feely, but we're talking real world now. You look at the how we've slipped in, uh, in in many of the, the 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 rankings. Well, infrastructure we've gone from one to depending on what you look at, study you look at, 15 or below in the world as far as quality of infrastructure. Uh, and that will have devastating uh, economic impact on all of us. I don't know what we have to do to get that message uh, across because we've become so complacent. Uh, will it take more serious uh, tragedies? Uh, and, and, and even if it's not a human tragedy, it certainly is, a, is an economic tragedy uh, to show people how, yeah, what happens when a barge does run into a, a, a pylon or a bridge or whatever, or a bridge collapses, then all of a sudden we recognize it. Uh, and that's something, that's a kind of discussion I think we need to, as mayors, need to figure out how to better uh, talk about. The other thing is, is that infrastructure, which used to be the most bipartisan of, of issues, has suddenly become very partisan. Uh, you know, and the, the differentiation between infrastructure as an investment and infrastructure purely as a stimulus has caused has caused this rift, and, and that's another thing that's, that's so unfortunate because it's both. Uh, and we, we need, I think, need to do a much better job in this group if we're going to get the nation concentrating on, on what to do, on pushing these kind of national discussions. Uh, and it's funny because when you, I get calls from reporters, man, it's like, it's like infrastructure 101. Mm -hmm. They're just not thinking that way. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of catch-up to do, but I think as, uh, if we keep hammering the message through, maybe someone will listen. And it's, it's shocking that we have to have that kind of uh, approach and that kind of discussion in, in the United States 
where we didn't used to have it, but we do now. So. Uh, Mayor Smith, you sound like uh, Tom Friedman a little bit, a lot, as a matter of fact. And it's okay. <laughs> uh, my comments are somewhat similar, but first of all, I had an opportunity to visit China, Regal China, and I saw the port of uh, Changshu, which is number seven on there. I think we got to realize they built that port in six years, and it's now the seventh largest port in the world. And that's what I call political will or national will to do that. And that leads to my question is I've heard three times now, or at least twice, maybe three times, that we need a national policy. We need a national policy. We need a national policy on infrastructure. We need a national policy on on transportation. I can tell you we need a national policy on the environment. We need a national policy on all these things. What is it about us at this point in time that we cannot have a national dialogue or policy or get to these things so we can do it other than the political lack of political will? I think that's probably it, but somehow or another, we've got to get our act together and have a national program to address these issues of infrastructure, transportation, and the environment and others. So that's my comment. I wish we, we need to, we need to, if we can focus on it as mayors, maybe we can push that effort to get these policies out there because we all know we cannot move together unless we know what's coming from the top and what they want and how they want to do it and then we can act from there. So we need to, uh, that national policy. So, hmm? oh. is it on? Yes. Good morning. I'm Carol Chatham from Cerritos, California. Although Cerritos is a stone throw from Long Beach, and I believe that the anything that happens in the regional area thus affects other cities who may not be a direct port city. Um, I think the the topic is very, very timely and appropriate for the fact that not only I think we can push a national uh, message regarding ports and transportations and also our infrastructure, but more importantly, I think the Conference of Mayors can be the conduit to get regional and local uh, transportation infrastructure plan so that you can we can develop a more national um, strategy, so to speak, to push forward for of funding as well as partnerships. Um, as the Southern California uh, area, the, the Southern California Government of, of, uh, Governments Association actually is pushing forward a regional transportation plan, and I think that would be something that the Conference of Mayors can actually have a document to review and to, to once it's passed, that we can uh, incorporate that type of um, plan, or at least aware of it, so when we put a, a plan together or a, a motion to push forward with this, that some of our key uh, local areas um, are incorporated in our message. So I applaud the uh, Conference of Mayors for putting this forward, and thank you, Mayor Brown, for your hospitality, and absolutely, I echo what uh, Mayor Foster said, the uh, hospitality.